leadership or lighthouse. Well done um, for all that you do. And for everyone that has taken time to be here today, amazing stuff. Keep drawing, keep taking in. Um, I want to specifically encourage all the creatives in the house, you know, whatever stake that you hold within the space, um, well done, and keep pushing. There's a lot ahead of us as creative people, and the future is now finally ours, if you understand what I mean. So um, get excited and think more of your power and your influence, right? So, first of all, you know that there's nothing that is just happenstance in the world. The problem of so many people is the face value at which we interpret stimulus and experiences and a lot of the things that we encounter on a daily basis. Everyday experience of contemporary life is backed up with agendas at any point in time. There's no demilitarized zone. And probably the reason why a lot of people are powerless, weak, poor, disrespected, and tired, essentially is because they have this naive view of their necessary due human experiences that they get unguarded, for want of a better word, short of saying on serious about the outcomes that they prefer. And you do understand that nothing positive finds its way to acceptance without resistance. Nothing. And so the moment you understand that, you fortify yourself with instruments, intangible and intangible form that allow you to sit powerfully and stand strongly in your reality. Now, Superman came out of the closet, um, I think last year. I hope you are aware that Superman came out to say he's now um, no longer straight and is now essentially, you know, gay. You have no idea what that means. Where do you start from? You fill your son's room with Superman pictures. You are prejudiced mightily against the gay movement. Now, your son's superhero has now come out to say Superman is now gay. So, because we forget that they are endless to everything. And I want to speak to you from that perspective today, and maybe that will give you the type of freedom, just the type of freedom and resolve to really begin to not just express yourself, but to express yourself powerfully, deliberately, in a way that rent a space in the head of every human being in the world, and you penetrate your own agenda on that. You see, there are three people in the world at any point in time. The people you see every day, otherwise called the masses, they are the weakest in the world, but they are in the majority. It may interest you to know that, in case you don't know, I'm sure most people know, that only 1% of the population of the world control 99% of the wealth in the world. 1% of the people in the world, just 1% of them control 99% of the wealth. The remaining 99% of people enjoy only 1% of the wealth and struggle to define all of their meaning within the available 1% of the wealth in the world. 99% of that wealth is in the hands of just 1% of the people. It's interesting if you expand that a bit and realize that 
the economy of the universe is bigger than humans. For every human being, for every human being, there are 2.5 million ants. You don't understand? I, I'm not sure you understand. For every you, you alone, for every you, there are 2.5 million ants in the world. For two people, there are 5 million ants. The whole world has about 20 quadrillion ants. I'm not talking about fish. I'm not talking about um, grasshoppers. I'm not talking about cockroaches. You can take time to Google how many of these things we have in the world. You realize that you are so small in the universe that God manages every day. Your economy is, you don't understand what I'm saying. Do you know how many fish are in the ocean? The ocean alone, we're not counting rivers, ponds, and different, just ocean. Eight trillion. So you have more, and you know, ants, you know the Bible even says go to the ants. So, so there's an instruction there. So when you go to the ants, you find an incredible structure. I've seen ants building a bridge, built a bridge to cross a stream. And they put leaves and... You see ants carry their dead. They leave no one behind. You see them in formation. They have queens. They have, they have soldiers. They have citizens, they have workers. They have an entire system going. And God is aware of them. He's aware of them to the extent that he referred the hope of, for our stupidity to their reality. That just in case your mind is in the reverse and you overrate yourself consider the ant who in his because at times the only way you see that scripture is thinking of savings it's just telling you one aspect of the world of the ant and saying that that ant has so much going including that it prepares for winter in summer thank you can I come down I can. Would the camera be okay? Phew. I'm not used to standing there. I just, this is what I'm used to. Do you get what I'm saying? So you find the ant busy, it could save. You don't know what it means to save. You have no idea what savings is to the human condition. Because what what is telling you is that in the jungle, where the ant lives is an outlier. A major outlier because in the jungle there's no savings. You catch, if a lion catch an antelope today, he has to consume as much as he can consume. First of all, the items are perishable. So there's a lifespan to what he has caught. So he has to consume as much as he can. So there are no warehouses. There's no storage. There's no freezer. You see what I'm saying? So, if, as a human being, you don't know how to put something away, it's jungle behavior. You are free to add one of the names of the animals into your name. For example, if you are Olakunle Shurion, you can say, for example, you are Olakunle Shurion Antelope, Olakunle Antelope Shurion. Or you can say James, you know, Python Shurion. <laughs> Essentially because, though you are human, you share methodology with animals in the jungle who essentially are thoughtless and critically spontaneous and instinctive without the benefit of reasoning. So by the time you are sharing methodology with animals in the jungle, you declare an equity, level of equity between you and them. It means that 
you are essentially not different from them. In fact, equal to them on many levels. Anything you share methods with is most likely equal to you. The commonality of the human condition is that all of us share similarities. Though we are recognized and rewarded for our difference, we do share minimum similarities as endorsement of our design. So we all have a nose. We all have, but my type of nose is what makes me a lacunation. Your type makes you Charles. But essentially, we all have a nose. We have eyes. But that allows us to fall within the bracket, bracket of a human family. But to come and recognize you as Charles, we have to move away from our similarities to our difference. So life does not recognize you nor reward you for your similarities. You are rewarded and recognized for your difference. Your difference will be your critical success factor. Your difference will be your critical relevance factor. Your difference will be your critical um, greatness factor. Rewarding factor. What most people can do is least rewarding. For example, everybody can brush their teeth. Who gets paid for it? Anybody can go to bed. You don't need formal training to know how to get angry. Any fool can get angry. So there can't be payment for it. You understand what I'm saying? There's 11 things any fool can do. Any fool. Any fool can get angry. Any fool can keep malice. Have you noticed? You shouldn't pride yourself in anything everybody can do. Because there is very low, if any, very low premium on it. The system, the culture, the powers that be never prioritize those things. Am I talking to you? So, when God in his scripture began to say, go to the ant, you sluggard. Now, let's also be clear who a sluggard is. A sluggard is not a lazy person, as you would like to think. A sluggard is someone who doesn't finish what he starts. He doesn't go all the way. That's why you have a scripture that says a sluggard does not roast what he took. In. If you know the effort that it takes to take something in hunting, you know it's not a lazy man. A lazy person cannot catch a game in hunting. So the man can hunt. Do you know what it means to... And because the Bible did not place a particular um, description of what it took in hunting, it's a blank check. So we can say it's a lion or a rabbit. Because it said a slugger does not roast what it took in hunting. So you can put anything there. So let's put a lion. So if somebody has worked hard... So, so risk his entire life to hunt a lion down and kill the lion, you know he's not lazy. But if he doesn't roast what he has killed, they say he's a sluggard. One translation says that he's full. Imagine it. That every time you go in hunting, you bring the animals home and you just keep them there. What's going to happen to your home after a while? Terrible stench. You chase people away. Nobody wants to come around you. Not for not having. But the curation of your total experience is incomplete. So you can be creative all you want. You can die poor in your creativity. Let's be clear. A lot of people are not creative. But there is a sense in which you can consider that the person that knows how to speak English and the person who doesn't know how to speak English at all can still be equal, depending on the deployment. So if you know how to speak English and you don't speak it, and somebody does not know how to speak English at all, in your own mind, you are different. But in the mind of those who experience both of you, you are the same. But in the mind 
of the people who paid for your own ability to speak English. You are worse. Because the person who doesn't know how to speak English has not invested time, energy, and resources in that direction. So we can give his nations. It's understandable because ignorance is not not knowing. Ignorance is not knowing in spite of investment. Not knowing at all is cluelessness or nescience. It's nescience. That is a state of unawareness. You are not expected to know. There is no investment of time, energy, or resource in that capacity to know. So if you don't know, you are understood. If a lawyer cannot shoot a gun, it's accepted. It is if you cannot argue a case in court that we have a problem. Because he has remained ignorant in spite of training. If a police officer cannot check if you have malaria or not, it's acceptable. But if you cannot cock a gun, or at least aim a target, or you can't even recognize one, then we have a problem. Because his ignorance is not supposed to be because his entire faculty has been impacted by training. Am I talking to you? So, there is a minimum level of expectation just because he comes as a police officer. We have a minimum level of expectation based on the curriculum of his training. If someone is a medical doctor and then they take him to the theater, he's, ah, I can't look at blood. Ah. They will say, how did you get here for, 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 for once? You, do, you can't look at blood. How did you get medical? How did you pass through medical school where you are, you are looking at blood all day long? Did he buy his degree or how did he get to do it? Because you have been impacted by training. This level of um, concern cannot be demonstrated by you. You have lost your right. You should have lost your right to feel like this as much and as you must have lost the capacity to feel like this. Even if you started like that. You should have dropped out of medical school because of this behavior. If you have made it all the way, you are now a doctor, you can't be having, you will still have other problems in life. But you can't have this problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm going somewhere, I'm trying to thought for you. So, you have problems like consistency, big picture thinking, sense of thoroughness, sense of mission, um, Understanding basic economics of your craft and so many things. Tomorrow, I'm, I'm going to delve into the money conversation because it is the person that is well that can donate blood. Mm? If you go to the hospital, that I want to give you all my blood, I want to donate it, and you are HIV positive. And I'm not trying to disrespect anybody struggling with that. Please forgive me. But assuming the person is, they would appreciate the offer. It's a highly noble one. They'll probably write you a letter of commendation that you offered. Wow. But they will reject the blood. Because the blood is in, incapable of offering support at the level you are offering it. Your sincerity is irrelevant. Sincerity is not a factor of production. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneur. Do you see sincerity there? People are sincerely in jail. People are sincerely poor. People are sincerely frustrated. People are sincerely broke. People are sincerely confused, sincerely raped. Hello? So I always try to wake up people who put a lot of premium on sincerity. It has value when you are alone with God. But to engage in the culture, please, you have to supply more than sincerity. You know how the scripture says, add to this, this, add to this. Sincerity is not an independent variable. It's a dependent one. It's like hope. If all you have is hope, I, I kid you not you will live a very miserable life. Because, first of all, understand the character of hope in itself. 
by his own design. He has capacity to design your weariness. If you don't convert it to outcome within the frame, say hope deferred, make. Please, what is doing the making? No, I'm asking you. What is doing the making? The hope. It is the hope itself that will begin to design your weariness if you don't supply some other quantities as, 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 as fast as possible. Hope deferred, make the heart sick. Somebody that said, but, ah, ah, but hope make it not ashamed. I said, no, you are jumping. You jump a lot. Go back to that same scripture that hope make it not ashamed. And go and read all the things you have been added. Yeah. Add to this, that. Add to this. The last one was add to that hope and hope make it not ashamed. You just can't jump to hope make it not ashamed. Hope on its own will make you ashamed. You will be very grossly ashamed. There are other ingredients that are recommended that you must add perseverance, you must add this and that, patience, you must add da, 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 before hope now make it not ashamed. Hope is not an independent variable. It's a dependent one. So is sincerity. Stay with me. So by the time you see the genius of the ant have you ever seen a fish in the water worried see what's going on see it's the tilapias the way they are moving we are, we are, we are, we are marginalized we are marginalized we need to be able to you see let me tell you something the sharks are too ambitious you don't see once any fish get into the water they are genius it's exposed Take that fish into the jungle. There is no determination that can keep it alive. It's not just its environment. It's going to die sincerely. <laughs> it will sincerely die. It doesn't need any enemy. You know, the Bible promises that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. There's a promise for that. But there is none for the one you form against yourself. As long as the weapon is outside in, you are safe. Once it's inside out, God, you, let me tell you something. Once it's inside out, eh, the solution as well is inside out. <laughs> there are people you cannot help. About four of them. The worst of them is anybody that thinks you are part of their problem. You can't help them. Because that's internal. Even God cannot help you. I'm sorry to say. If you think you don't have a problem, you have a problem, nobody can help you. You will argue with a doctor for un unnecessarily because you think you don't have a problem, but you have a problem. If you don't know the size of your problem, you can still be helped if you understand that you have a problem. Because that's why you need a doctor, right? That's why you need help. But the worst is if you think that the person, your helper, is part of your problem. Ah, man, you are stuck. You are stuck. Are you with me, please? So there are characterizations within the human experience that you have to prioritize and understand that there is no one saved from such characterization. In the same way that there is no seniority in the grave <laughs> you can't say i came first no it's the same experience for everybody once you enter the grave you are the experience is say come is there's no there's no level you understand there's no boss there's no no you don't understand i was a billionaire when i was alive there's nothing like that the worms are coming to eat you. The, the insects are coming to eat you. You are going, you're, same, just, even if they put you in a gold, so ants, you can move out. Why? See, I'm in a golden coffin. Can't you see? I'm in a golden coffin. Go and eat people in the wood coffin. There's nothing like that. There are things in life that define a level playing field for everybody. One of them is death. You don't get so intelligent 
Do you understand? And, and <laughs> you see, some things, even though that is being disrupted now, there's a book called The Death of Death. And there are now facts that by 2045, death will be a choice. Fact. And the authors are sure they will not die. They are very sure. A friend of mine is struggling with an ailment. I told him, fight, fight. Because I can assure you that in another seven years, there will be cure. Just stay alive. Just stay alive. Just fight for another seven years. You'll be all right. But by 2040, 2045, the only way people will die is through accidents. Not natural causes and not diseases. And I know that is way, way, way billions of miles away from where you are right now in your thinking. And you are wondering, wait. But before you think too far, let me let you know that God doesn't have a problem with it. You know, every time you read the Bible, everything you read is different resolutions. You can be interpreting the scripture within a, a low resolution. But it, it won't be, a, your, your interpretation is not a lie. It's just a lower resolution of the same truth. Oh, come on. Yeah. I mean, we, I mean, I'm with creatives, Ravi. So you know what it means to have different resolutions of a thing. You can have a picture in different resolutions. It's the same picture. We are not debating that it's not the same picture. But it can be in a resolution that gives a different experience than the highest resolution of it. So a scripture like, oh, death, where is there, I think? That is different resolution. So when those guys are doing the end of death, is, that is a resolution, that is another resolution than the way you think. Woo! Human parts will be printed 3D. Hmm? It's okay that people, that probably some people in this room will not be... You don't need to worry about it because you, you may not be alive at that time. <laughs> I mean, 2050 is 30, is how many years from now? We're in 2022. That's how many years? 28 years. Eh? 28 years. Because I started counting 30 years from 2020. So beat it now. If you are 60, you'll be 90. Most likely, you'll be gone. Most likely. If you are 70, you'll be 100. Come on. You are probably not in this conversation. And it's okay. Look, it's okay. Look, no, actually, nobody should be afraid of dying. Nobody should be afraid of dying. Dying is... Did you see any scripture in the Bible where anybody was binding the spirit of death? <laughs> it's you guys that do that. There's nobody in the Bible... Jesus saw death. He didn't say, I find you. He said, what you do, do quickly. Because you see, death is an, is an errand. And the one who has the power of that death has been defeated. And power of death has been taken away from him. And, the death, and God doesn't borrow the devil once in a while. You see what I'm saying? The key is to it. Stephen saw death coming. He didn't say, I bind death. No, he just... Forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Yada, yada, yada. Then the Bible said that Jesus stood up when he saw that death was going to Stephen. Death was going to Stephen. Jesus saw it. Jesus stood up. Stephen himself saw death coming. He had time to pray for everybody stoning him. Nobody bound, bound the spirit of death. Nobody. Jesus saw it coming. He didn't stand up. He didn't stand up to bind it. He stood up to focus on his son. Jesus saw death coming. He stood up. He faced it. He even told Judas, what you do, do quickly. You know, all the apostles in the Bible, all the prophets, they were killed. God came down on earth. He died. He died. There's not one person in the Bible who bind the spirit of death. If you really understand the weight of purpose, you will put death in perspective. 
when you are afraid to die, it's purposelessness. You don't know. It. There is something called APP, Assignments Protective Power. Hmm? Your assignment, oh my God, I wish I have time to break that down, but today is not the day. If I send you to Lagos, how much do I give you? If I send you to Lagos to go and buy a microphone, let's say the microphone is 10,000 naira, how much will I give you to go to Lagos from Abuja? Hmm? 210, you go by flight. I'll give you 500k because you still stay in the hotel. How long will I give you to go and come back? I can even give you two days. So I can give you one million naira. Stay in the hotel for, for two days, buy your ticket, and buy the microphone. If I send you to, um, where are we in Abuja? Give me a place in Abuja. Who said to, to go and buy the same microphone? How much will I give you? <laughs> eh? Both. So let's say 5K. I can give you 10K just to indulge you. 10K, and how long will I give you? One hour, two hours. I can give you five hours. Can you give you the whole day? Tops. I've indulged you to any length. If I send you to London to go and get the same microphone, how much do I give you? Hmm? If I'm flying, how much? Like 700,000. 7 million. I give you 10. How long will I give you? <laughs> eh, how much will I give you? What does I stand in? How much will I give you? A week. I can give you two weeks. But the sense in that conversation is, it is the errand that determines how much you have and how long you stayed. Hmm? It's not your choice. It's the errand. How long you will live, how much you will have in your entire existence are all tied to your assignment. To be ignorant of it is where your restlessness begins. All your re hustling is that you are ignorant of your errand. But let's pack that. Let me unpack this. So, so you have the mind. And the masses are always dealing with all these things that I'm talking about. Justifiably so. A lot of experiences are curated for the masses to carry. But the masses are controlled by another set of people. Those you see when they are revealed or when they are appointed. The masses are the people you see every time. But there are people you only see them when they are revealed. When they are appointed. CEOs. Actors, politicians, musicians, public figures as a whole, celebrities. They control the masses. What they do control the thinking and the attitude of the masses. So the masses are the largest community, the weakest community. They are controlled by this fewer set of people. So you find in Nigeria, for example, 200 million people complaining about how many people in government. 200 million people. And their problem is just maybe about how many people are in government. <laughs> I used to have the number. I just left my mind. Eh? And that's their problem. And they actually have the mind to believe that's their problem. And they believe so. But you see, those you see when they are shown are controlled by those you don't see at all. Those you don't see are sometimes called cabal. At times they are called the mafia. At times they are called power centers. They are called different names. But they control the people you see and the people you see control the majority that you see every time. So let me give you an example of that works, how that works. So, so the people you don't see create options. And they take a stake in all the options. So that whichever of the options you choose, you are choosing them. Those people are never partisan. They don't care whether you choose PDP or APD, APC, um, Democrat or Republican, Labour or Conservative. They have a stake in all of it. Anyone you choose, you choose them. It's common sense. 
necessary for curating power of architecting it. Some people say, I love Facebook. I, I hate Facebook. I prefer Instagram. Well, you are paying the same person. It's called Mike Zuckerberg. No, 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 no. It's WhatsApp. WhatsApp is more. You are paying the same person. Toyota is everybody's car. I prefer Lexus. You are paying the same company. They had, you, they had that your thinking in mind. So they gave you options. It's the same company producing the two. Puke Milk, Three Crown, the same company. Hello? DSTV, Go TV, the same company. One for the masses, one for those of you that want to feel special, who still collect your money. Do you know how many companies are owned by, whew, where's my phone? I need to tell you, one, one brand owns all these companies. I have to show you this. This will, this will give you, this will, this will interest you. Ooh, let me quickly get it out of my, please permit me. Yeah, it's opening now. Open, open, open. Okay. One brand called LVMH. One brand called LVMH. Ah, internet is so crazy. Come on. Ah. There are places in this world that when you are browsing like this, just, it, it has moved. Just blink, and it, it moves at the speed of blinking. But some, some other places, you grow gray hair. I, I didn't mention anyone. <laughs> Come on. So under the LVMH brand, that's not open, but I will tell you what I know. You have Dio. You have Bulgari. You have Sephora. You have Dom Perignon. You have, come on. Somebody with a better internet should help me, please. You have it? Thank you. One brand, 75 in total. Dior, Fendi, Givenchy, Marc Jacobs, Salah McCartney, um, Laura Piana, Kenzo, Celine, Sephora, um, Tagore, Bulgari, Tiffany, thank you. Uh, let's keep going. Look at all of that. Wines, under wine alone, under jewelry, retailers, fashion. Can, can we see the 17 brands under fashion alone? Cosmetics. This is LVMH. And somebody will tell you, I hate Dior. <laughs> Some can say, look, I don't, I prefer Givenchy, you know, Givenchy, I, I don't like Louis Vuitton, it's too much noise. Everywhere, every, 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 what, what should I be wearing? You are paying these guys. Because this is how real power works. Do you understand? So the people with power consistently create options. Options. The more options they take, the more stake they have. And the more inclusive they become, the more purchasing power they bring into their net. I'm going somewhere. It's worse in the election too. So, register to vote, get your PVC, it's true. You must get your PVC. You must vote. Except that you will be doing that too late. Because if you have the right to vote with the earliest PVC registration, you are the first person that registered. Your card is laminated. Everything is ready to vote. But the powers that be have given you three fools as candidates. What is the power of your vote? 
when you are coming to use your power to vote to make a choice between three fools. Hmm? Can you see that you came too late? So, candidate A, fool. Candidate B, fool. Candidate C, fool. And all you have done is PVC. I'm coming with your PVC. What did he say? Choose your fool. Choose your fool. <laughs> so, if you really want to be engaged and you really want to be a determinant factor, voting is powerful, but party administration is more powerful. Because it is in party administration that the options emerge. So, if you really want to change things, you need to get involved in where the options are. Yeah. And where the options come out from. Otherwise, you are just that majority controlled by the people you see and people you see controlling the people you don't see. Controlled by the people you don't see. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Is that over your head? This is how the world works, guys. Whether you call it capitalism, or you call it democracy, or you call it product development, or market segmentation, you call it brands, I just showed you an entire network. This is just one brand. Louis Vuitton, all of them, everybody, whichever one you want, we have a product for you. So, the reality is that as you begin to think of your stake under the sun, you need to be clear about the agenda you represent. Because things, value doesn't just go everywhere. They are architects of the experiences you are, experiences you are having. You are not just waking, you just don't like a particular designer mistakenly. There is a reason why most fast foods have red color in their, in, their, in their logo. They're telling you something very subliminal, but they're telling you that the food is hot and fresh. That's why they put red there. Almost every fast food company, almost every restaurant has red somewhere in there. Almost all. So they have a different narrative that they are trying to push. So the problem with Africa, essentially, is that we run around the best ideas without a clear agenda. We just take things at face value. For example, we just want to succeed. There's no room for that. Every fool wants to succeed. Please, for me, if I use the word foolishness, in my world, foolishness is not an insult. It's a state of existence. It means there is a set of behavior that conforms to a definition. As you can't call a carpenter a surgeon, you can't call a fool a wise person. Or call a wise person a fool. Even Paul said, oh foolish, he didn't say, Let, let's confess positive, oh wise Galatians. No, they are not wise. They are acting in a way that is consistent with the meaning of foolishness. They are fools. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, why should the world give you space? Why? Like I said, tomorrow I'm going to go into a lot of communication on um, economics. The economics of this, cre this creative economy. But understand this. Why should the world give you space? First of all, you must understand that to be creative in itself is essentially, essentially at the base, a gift of nature. So the entry point is easy. Unlike medicine. So in, in, in creativity, you have a triangle, and at the base, anybody can come in. But to be rewarded, the more rewards you seek, the smaller the space, and at the very top of it, you have very few people taking all the value. But in medicine, for example, it's an inverted triangle. 
to come in at the top. At the bottom, it's top because it's just the triangle is inverted. But once you come in, have you seen a poor medical doctor before anywhere in the world? We never have enough. Even in Nigeria, you can't have a medical doctor who is poor. No. That's not possible in any country. You can have one who is struggling, who doesn't have enough, who is just barely middle class, but you can't have one poor, struggling to find food. There's nothing like that. The skill is not enough. It, it's not enough in any society. In America, America has a two million deficit of nurses. Two million. So they're going to invent all kinds of programs to attract nurses. Never have enough. So once you have a reality that almost anyone, it's like soccer. Do you know how many people can play football in Nigeria? Too many, including me. <laughs> I played for my school. I played for, I used to think I'm going to play for the national team. For <laughs> but how many of those players will make it into the 22 people in the national team? 22. Out of millions of soccer players, only 22 at any point in time will be, and only 11 will be on the pitch. Only 11. Man, you have to be super, super, super different on many levels, including being politically different. Because at times, it's not talent that we do it. It's relationship. So let me close. My advice for you, therefore, is creativity, no doubt, is the future. There's so much going on. But as a race, sorry, as, a, as humans in the world, not a race, because God didn't create races. As human beings in the world, the benefit we have over any other species is the gift of self-questioning. In other words, the gift of reasoning. If the lion could do that, it would have shaved. You don't know how different the lion can look, except that he can't question why he has a lot of beards. If the lion can one day say, must I have beards, that's it. He will shave the next day. The reasons why we shave is because we could question it. We could say, why must this be? The reason why you could move to Lagos is you could say, you know what, I'm tired of this place. A lion cannot do that. The lion cannot say, you know what, I'm tired of the jungle. I need to move to the sea. You can't do that. So the gift of reasoning, the gift of self-questioning, that is the power of that human being. And that for me is education. So let me quickly define that education for you. And let me quickly shift that into a discipline I think you should put yourself through. Two of them. And once you do that, I'm very sure that it's only a matter of time before you begin to fly the flag of your own beliefs and thinking at the highest level in the world. Education, therefore, um, is what we lost when colonialism happened. We, we try to define what we lost through slave trade and colonialism. But the key loss is that the white man gave us, took our education and gave us the classroom. And the classroom has been our undoing till today. Because the classroom is not enough to capture human genius. And it's not even us. We don't learn in the classroom. We learn through apprenticeship and observation. That's how we learn as a people. The classroom is essentially Western. It's not part of our reality. We now know that first in class is not necessarily first in life. And you have seen how people have turned the world around by the sheer force of the application of their creative genius. So education is the ability of the human spirit to do four things. Number one, to experience his world. Number two, to question that experience deeply enough to find the options that exist in it and to know which of those options to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency.
I'll say it again. Education is the ability of the human spirit to question, to experience this world, to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it and to know which of those options to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. By that definition, a lot of people are not educated, even with a PhD, because they cannot question their world. They cannot experience the world. When they can, they can't question what they are experiencing. When they can question it, they cannot give birth to options from what they are experiencing. And when they can give birth to options, they don't know how to choose the one to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. Therefore, they have passed the test of technicality of academics. They failed the test of education. Education is not a test of recall. It's the ability to create novel scenarios that unlock ease and gratitude within your environment. So an entrepreneur is not a businessman. Please welcome Pastor Chola. Please help me welcome. Him. Thank you, sir. Four minutes more. So because you are in business, doesn't make you an entrepreneur. Let's be clear. To be an entrepreneur, you are actually an innovator. You are bequeathing something of such intrinsic value to society that unlocks gratitude in that society and lifts it from its prevailing state to a higher state. So an entrepreneur is a servant of society, giving us products, services, sharing ideas, philosophies. So you have somebody created a division of labor. His name is Adam Smith. For me, that's an innovator. That's a highly creative person. Who could look at the reality, the prevailing accepted standard of his time and say, we need to go here. Somebody created capitalism. Somebody invented democracy. Human beings birthing system of thinking, systems of government. Somebody created poetry, branded it as you know it. Somebody gave you science as you know it. You know, somebody said we should come and be certified in a particular area, which I'm certified in. Um, but I told the person who was demanding on the certification, I said, I have it, this is it, but I'm not submitting it. And I said, I'm going to prove a point with this. The first person that certified people, who certified him? <laughs> Why do you come here and make learning look like it has to be horizontal, man to man? Not that it's vertical. It can come from zero to one. It doesn't have to be one to infinity. It doesn't have to be from man to man. The first, the first person that said this is law, who told him? The first thing that said this is how accounting would be. Who, how did he know? So somebody receives it zero to one, then brands it and put it out to say, this is how everybody must now learn. One to infinity. And that is oppressive because it limits your capacity to birth newness. The world was not created one to infinity, zero to one. It was created from nothing. How do we move from nothing, guys? That's where true creativity is. And the world will reward you when you learn to think zero to one. If you think one to infinity, they can pay you something. But to dominate in this world, to own Twitter, to be the founder of Google, to be the founder of Facebook, to be the founder of Microsoft, man, you have to do zero to one. For spiritual people who have God on the inside of them, that should be ease. But today is not for that conversation. That is almost past right. So it's gross waste to have that spirit inside of you <laughs> and be thinking horizontal and doing very silly things. The energy of expansion is horizontal. Like you have a gospel that has to spread to the world. But somebody has given you the gospel zero to one. Then you can employ marketers and distributors to take it around the world. But in that machinery, you are the king benefit. So somebody created Facebook. There's now Facebook in every country. Everybody in the world now has Facebook. Facebook, Facebook, Facebook everywhere. But somebody, on one point, is attracting all of that purchasing power to headquarters in Seattle. You praise Japan for its power. But look at Japan alone, just in Japan. Honda, Toyota, Mitsubishi, um, um, Panasonic, 
Sony, um, Itachi, um, Datsun. Um, you could go on and on. Korea, Hyundai, Kia, Samsung, LG, Germany, Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen, Heineken, Saab, Adidas. You could go on and on. United States, everybody here will name a brand. That's what I like to say. You all name a brand, I will not exhaust it. It's why it's the most powerful economy in the world. We need saviors, guys. My time is about 20 seconds more, but I will take another five minutes. Is that okay? Just another five minutes. We need saviors, guys. Saviors. Not just people who want to make money. We need saviors who will be responsible for how we experience this life. If economics is the key driver of your energy, honestly, you will have some type of space, but you will still be small, weak, and silly in the world. Interestingly, optimism is free. Those are the true nutrients for receiving because at the end of the day, the best of your effort is to be open. Power visits you. You don't pursue your dreams, you position for them. Pursuing your dream is hustling. That's not natural to the human condition. So you can't find a cure to cancer. But you need to say, I want to find it. Then the cure will find you. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is what they mean when they say, ask and you shall seek. Knock. It shall be open. Who is opening it? It didn't say, knock and you shall open it. Knock. And it shall be open. Seek and you will find. And many people think that finding is. That's not finding. Let me tell you. This, these things are different resolutions. So this thing is here. And you are walking. I really want to. I need to find. It's not that you know it's going to be here. Then all of a sudden. You have found it. Eh? That's finding. It's not searching, it's positioning. It finds you. And if you read the Bible, they didn't say goodness and mercy shall be before you to be pursued all the days of your life. They say goodness and mercy shall follow you. Your dreams gravitate towards you. The problem is you are searching for what is searching for you. Researchers are not people who are just smarter than everybody. No. They are just positioned and put, them in a, put themselves in a place to find something. Because there is someone at the top who is committed to the advancement and peace of the world. That person is looking for whoever will stand in the gap ready to receive. Then all the juice of that expectation goes towards those people. If you are ready, you are late. Don't invest too much trying to get everything set. Just get, just put yourself out there. And everything meets you there. You see what I'm saying? There's academics, what you are taught. There's education, what you teach yourself. There's revelation, what you are given. And at some point in the equation of converting zero to one, you will experience both education and revelation. Your education positions you. Your revelation empowers you. And that is true for spiritual people, even for sinners. Because at the end of the day, there's no Christian internet. There's internet. And God needs it to come to the world. Whoever is ready will receive it. Have I helped you? So, what does it take as a pharmacist to believe you can find the cure to cancer? What does it take? For some people, maybe 50 years of research. For those same people, maybe seven billion dollars. But that's a distraction. What it really takes is for you to say, I want to find it. And within the little resources that you have, even if it's just expectation, start putting it out. Yeah. Just start putting it out. Even if it's just article you can begin to write for now, we can find the cure to cancer in our lifetime and start putting it out. Before you know what is happening, something will visit you. People will find you. Resources will meet you. Things start working for you. 
Because a part of you is saying, I can contain this. Yeah. And if I see it, I'll recognize it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Particularly as underdogs. Yeah. Once you have this skin on your body, trust me, you are an underdog in this world. You need something higher helping you. <laughs> Let's be clear. So you can't just continue to wait for the facts to support you. You need dynamics that transcend the limits of facts. And that is the truth. And those are intangibles. So get ready in your mind. Did you get that? Start changing how you see. Don't just decide to have an app that can be used by some people in your village or in Nigeria or in Lagos. Think of the whole world. How can this app be seen everywhere in the world and used? Tomorrow we are going to get into that. How from here in a city in Abuja or a little corner in Kano, you can create, curate an idea that the whole world is using. We are now in the borderless world. Geographies are melted. Borders are being melted more than ever before. We've never seen a borderless experience in the human condition as we are seeing now. And the key is technology. So understand that. So tools like enthusiasm, optimism, are free. They don't cost a dollar. Dreaming doesn't cost a cent. You see, faith, the cheapest of all. Cheap. Those things cost nothing. Begin from there. Begin from there. And pursuit is the proof of desire. So don't just say you are... The proof of that is set up a blog talking about how human beings can live in the air. Maybe you don't, have, you don't even know how it's going to happen yet. But start talking about it. Before you know what's happening, some people who are trying to fund that research will find you. And say, can you come, can we let, can you come and join this panel? Before you know what is happening, you are in the forefront of leading a different revolution. This creativity is a means to an end. It is never the end. So be clear of the big picture that your creativity will serve and plug into that. Right? Then discipline. Guys, discipline. And what is that? Understand that talent in itself and all of the Jews that define you in themselves are never enough. There is talent or gifting, right? And that's awesome. But in this world that we are living in, you have to convert that natural ability into a skill. Talent says, I have it. Skill says, hmm. I don't just have it. It is organized in a format the culture can see. So, for example, since year one you've been in the university, you've been planning events. You are a master in planning events, planning parties, you plan crusade or whatever it is you plan, and you make it perfect. But you can't go for a job, apply for something, or you want to be to be the coordinator of this event or the project team for this event. I say, what have you done before? Since year one. I've been planning. So by year two, you see, there was one crusade one time. But if you say, well, I have a project management certification. You have made that natural ability recognizable, transferable within the system. So a project management certification is a conversion from natural ability to a systemic ability. Something the system can now see and nest around. But it's not enough. The future is coming for you guys. Africa is the new frontier. I hope I have time to explain that. In the future, black is not a color, it's a vibe. And when it's a vibe, let me tell you what it means for color to be vibe. In, in Washington, if you see taxi cabs in Washington, right? They have different colors. Blue, red, green, cars all over the place. Different colors, but they are all called yellow cabs. They are all called yellow cabs. You see, yellow in that sense is not a color, it's a vibe. Because the colors have different colors. In the future, in the deep future, if the Lord tarries, there's no such thing as racism. The custodians of racism, as we have known it by themselves, have to combat color to a vibe. For every, for every, no, 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 no. In that future, in that future, there will be more black people working than white people living. If you are the white man, what will you do? You have to create some kind of soft landing and collaboration between all colors. So there's no threat to your existence. Because power dynamics dictate that whoever breached the order of peace and rhythm must be on ground to 
organize his restoration. Power dynamics dictate so. That is why the devil is the one that had to come and reorganize how humanity will be redeemed. <laughs> he had to kill Christ. If he messed everything up, he fixed everything. <laughs> you see? You know, it's power dynamics. The one who breached the other must be on the ground to organize his restoration. Who started colonialism? White man. Who ended it? White man. Who started slave trade? White man. Who ended it? White man. Who began military rule? Military. Who ended it? Military in, in civilian clothing. It's, it's just the way it is. Terrorism cannot end without the Middle East. America cannot end it. Yes. Power dynamics dictate so. You see what I'm saying? So if you come back to that reality, you need to camp around that and say, so how do I move myself? When the whole world comes to Africa to engage, the whole world is coming here. Yeah. By 2030, it will be over 1.2 billion people. Everyone is coming here. You will never see a bigger creative market as you will see within the next eight years. That's Position for it so that you can be a stakeholder when they come. Yeah. But when they come, they are not coming for everybody. They are coming for the masters of their field. The masters of their field. And that means now position for that. Transcend the limits of your talent, convert it to a skill. Then outgrow the limits of a skill. And whatever you can hang, but you're on a journey. Convert that skill to competence. What is competence? Positively deployed skill. So in the soccer team, there are four strikers. How many will wear the jersey? Eleven. At best, two strikers. Oh, okay. Strikers. In the, in, the, in the soccer team, there are like maybe three goalkeepers. How many will wear the jersey? One. one. The one that can stop balls from getting to the net. The most. You don't wear the jersey. The one that can put. All of us are skillful. Everybody is skillful. All the strikers are skillful. But the one who puts the ball in the net the most is the competent one. So you can be skillful and incompetent. The proof of that is that you are hitting the goal. Remember that guy? Remember that guy who cannot roast what he took in hunting? Mm -hmm. It's not a lazy man to kill a lion is hard work. But to not roast it, that finishing strength is not just there. You know how they do in Hollywood? But they are improving now, I must confess. But they write a script. The script is complex and complex and getting deeper and deeper. Then, somewhere at the, almost at the end, they get stuck. How do we now finish this script? Yeah. Time is going, there's no budget. Oh, speak to Baba Lao. <laughs> you just go and find one high priest. You just say, this is the answer. Boom, lazy, come on. That's that man that couldn't roast what he took in hunting. Everything is beautiful. The picture, everything is great. They'll be writing the story, but to now finish it, if there's somebody else in Hollywood, it may need another two years of thinking, of enduring mental block to come out of that, to find the end to that movie. Look at Matrix. Look at all the journey to that movie and how they had to end it. It's hard work. That's creativity. That is what people don't have. And then they get to that point. Let's go and talk to you know, the way to end it now is, let's go to a pastor. Pastor will just unravel the mystery. It's your mother that is causing it. Bam! <laughs> Lazy something. And then the powers that be in the world who reward creativity will now see that and say, they are not ready. They don't get it. And then it's a great writer, but look at where he goes talk. It would have been beautiful if you could go, go beyond this point. You see what I'm saying? Competence. Talent says I have it. Skill says I can do it. Competence says I do it. But competence is not enough for the future I'm talking about. You have to outgrow competence and demonstrate expertise. They are coming for the masters of their field. The journey to that is talent, skill, competence, expertise. What is expertise? I have done it. Skill, talent says I can do it. Skill says... So, sorry, talent says I have it. Skill says I can do it. Competence says I do it. Expertise says I've done it again and again across different, uh, sorry, again, time and time again across different spaces, different sectors, different industries. That's expertise. But that also is not enough, guys. You don't need to transcend expertise to be the stakeholder and the movable factor, when these guys come, the transferable engine, then you have to prove authority. And authority 
is not just being talented. Talent says, I have it. Skill says, I can do it. Competence says, I do it. Expertise says, I've done it time and again across different states. Industry says, I can reproduce me. Sorry, authority says, I can reproduce me. I can do all of that. I can teach it. I can reproduce me. That's authority. You now have a community of doers within your space who ascribe their genius to your strength. Then the world is ready for you. Am I talking to you? There's another layer, but I promise myself I will not discuss that layer until I put these thoughts in the book. So you have to endure that gap. Go work on this first. Before you become an authority, the book will be out. So you will now find that. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? I know this is not a service or a church program, so to say, but I, I want to pray for you. Is that enough? It doesn't matter whether you are a Muslim or you are a Christian or you are a Buddhist or you are, I respect all of that, but I want to pray for you. I'm a Christian, right? But I, I want to pray for you. You know, my business partner is a Muslim, right? One of my strong, strong clients is Buddhist. You know, I will relate. So, even if you are a Muslim, receive this moment. Hmm? Can I pray for you? So, Father, right now, You've had a beautiful experience with different speakers. We still have more, and we still continue tomorrow. But I sense that there is a transfer going on right now. The temptation is to drop this mic and walk away as another session, another seminar. But I do feel there is something waiting to come into this midst and res reside in people in this moment. And with the permission of the host, we receive that allowance and Spirit of God, we allow you. Let that transfer happen right now. Amen. People begin to receive beyond their logic. People begin to receive capacity beyond their training. Amen. They begin to receive attention beyond their experience. Amen. And resources begin to find ideas resident and trapped in people. Freedom begins to receive space, not just because we want to be free, but because a cause and an agenda is now ready for funding. Thank you, Spirit of God, for change as these people do their normal things in life, as we all go about our normal business, everyday issues of contemporary life will begin to be confronted with newness at a level unprecedented. We begin to curate power intelligently at a level that transcends all that we think we have known. We will win, and you will take all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Well, thank you. Thank you, PK. Thank you, sir. I had to be away briefly, but I was watching it um, on the stream. That was such an audacious and powerful session. Uh, the beauty of all of this, like I often say, is that it's, you know, because of technology, it's on all the different platforms. Uh, you can watch it, Lighthouse INT, um, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. It's going to remain there because when, when Kunle Shorinyan speaks, <laughs> you have to go home and try and digest the things that he've said. Can we appreciate? Um, let's, let's, let's just be appreciative of this gift and for this time here this morning. Well... Our timetable and schedule says we end at 3. Um, he's going to be back here tomorrow. Kunle Dewu is going to be here tomorrow. Chidera is going to be here tomorrow. Uh, Kemi is going to be here tomorrow. It's going to be a loaded, loaded day. Um, many of you didn't come in early. We had a 30-minute, you know, kind of pause just to let as many people in. So we want you to come in early tomorrow. Uh, this last few minutes will be for networking and a couple of other things. Uh, Pastor Wale is heading back to Lagos right now, so we need to take a couple of photographs. Uh, PK and David will just do that, and it'll be for networking. It's important that you get to meet other people. You never know who you need, who is your plug-in right now. 
who is connected to you where you are and who you're going to need to leverage on somehow and sometime in the future. So I'd want us to take a couple of minutes and just maybe again get to know somebody and, and just find out what they do. You know, you never can tell what value they're going to bring and add to you. We've heard a lot about networking today and connecting with people. Um, you, okay, where well, we will take some, you're ready. Do you have questions? Do you have questions? Because it's up to you. We can stay till six. Oh, yes. But it's up to you. Are there questions you want to ask? Okay, some hands. So you may all be seated. We'll take a couple of questions, but Pastor Wale needs to go. If you need to ask David um, some questions, he's also here. But let's release Pastor Wale so he doesn't miss his flight. Because tomorrow he's off to the UK, so he needs to go and see his wife. Absolutely. Can, can we just thank Pastor Wale for, for coming and for the sacrifice and what a powerful teaching we had. Um, that's also online. So please take, take the yes. photos now. Who are those with questions? All right. Can we have a microphone to him while pictures are going on? First question. Okay. Should I stand up or? Oh, well, I really, really appreciate the the value of this seminar. It has gone a long way to impart positively on us. My name is Ibrahim Ahmad. Uh, the question I want to ask, though I'm a bit late for this lecture. Uh, from what Mr. Kunle has spoken about, he, he did mention about talent. That talent says, I have it. He did mention of skills that I can do it. And he did mention about uh, competence that I have done it. Then from the competence, it graduated to expertise. And that the expertise is not even enough. You need the authority. That means that I have done it, I can do it, I can reproduce it. I want to say that in all these things, uh, can one really affirm it seriously without, without being in the right position to say it? How do you mean, sir? Like now, you can do all these things very well. But if you are not rightfully placed, can you be able to do it? No, the, like, question, uh, the question is, can you do all these things without being rightfully placed? Yes. That so is how do you become an authority without being rightfully placed? Like, uh, like now, a lot of people try to seek you, but you are hidden in a place. As, like now, a lot of people can fix this economy, but they are not being tapped. So by the time you, maybe you can be like that when you are just roving with talent. Then by the time you begin to communicate your skills, your skill communication is about people paying for it, right? So by the time you are maximizing that phase of your skill, you are, you are being forced to come out. Otherwise, you will never gra graduate into that. But what is even deeper is by the time you are, the culture is saying you are competent, you are definitely not hidden again. Because if you are still hiding, they will not even see you how much more to say you are competent or to find out that you are competent, right? So by the time you have to prove all these processes, you are out in the space. You can't mistakenly become an authority. By the time you become an authority, you have paid all kinds of deals. You have won all kinds of businesses. You have manifested in all kinds of spaces, right? You have showed up in the media. You are already, you know, you have done a lot to become an authority. You've published materials. You are the it. You see what I'm saying? So you really can't journey through this path, right, and not get the necessary attention that you, you desire. Now, I admit that in, in the world that we knew before the technocracy that we were coming into, it was very possible to localize your experience such that you can become a professor or a PhD holder in Nigeria and still suffer economically, right? But that is no longer possible if you pay attention to the language and the 
messages from the technology space, right? Because you now have the capacity to be seen, rewarded, and, and I don't want to preempt myself because tomorrow I'm going to get into a lot of that, right? So there is, it's not possible anymore. The Bible speaks of a poor wise man who was very wise but very poor. And that was called a, 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 it was called an evil under the sun. So technology allows the old world to see you and trust me, it's probably the highest test to whether you really have it or not. Because right now, the reason why you even become a star localized in your environment is because people who could do what you do in New York, they don't know that you are existing. The people assessing you and judging the quality of your work did not also have the benchmark of judging that side by side, somebody doing that same work in Paris, somebody doing that same work in New York. Now the internet is all the computers in the world on one spot. So by the time you are putting yourself out and putting your work out now, if you go on Fiverr, for, for example, right, or you go on, what's another um, gig economy platform? Upwork. Upwork, for example. You are saying, I can do graphic design. The next guy saying, I can do graphic design is in New York. The next guy saying, I'm good in graphic is in London. So you can't hide anymore. Your skills better be passing the test of universality. It's right. Or you'll yes. still be struggling. I, actually, you are right. Yeah. There is one journal I read yes. yesterday. A particular scientist was made a Nobel. He, he was made a Nobel laureate in science. Yes. Scientist. This year, there is a thesis that uh, he wrote about 10 years ago. And the man was from Sweden. He was just, he went to school to carry his daughter home only for someone to tell him that he has been nominated and he has won the Nobel laureate. And on what this is, he wrote that about 40,000 about 40, years ago, there are different species of human being. And that have a, I mean, it's, it's just something. All right, thank you very hey, much. We don't have all you. the time. Let's move on now. Okay. The next question, please. Just go straight to the question. Introduce yourself and the question. Okay, my name is Patrick Ubong. Um, my question actually goes to the first speaker. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not around. But um, anybody can um, help. Um, he, he talked about Christian's uh, song that it might not necessarily carry the name Jesus. Now, my question is, what is a balance to that? Because I've seen um, a situation where somebody wrote a song, put Jesus, went for production. They told him, no, you have to remove Jesus if this thing must sell. And some people did it and they make money. You know, some people refuse. But uh, the thing did not really go far, in quotes. So what is the balance? To, to this. Yes, um, another one is about the comedian thing. I've, I've, I've been in a, let me just ask the two so that whoever answer can answer. Yeah, um, the comedian, I, I mean, if we don't define our agenda, I believe um, we might not really get things done well. I've been in a meeting where somebody came and do comedy and then Majority of people laughed. I couldn't laugh because it was not a defying. It was, it, to me, it was just foolishness. It, it shouldn't have been part of the service. It, it spoiled the whole atmosphere. So what is the balance to this? You can Thank go. you. You can go. You hear me? Okay. All right, so I'll start with what Pastor Wally said because I was here when he was talking about and he specifically talked about Christians not just focusing on just gospel music that has to do with Jesus. He specifically said, as Christian writers or a singer, you don't have to sing a worship song or write a worship song that is all about Jesus. What about other spaces? And that's part of what this is all about. As in, as Christians, 
we have other spaces that we can exist in. It does not have to be gospel music that is strictly about Jesus. That was what he said. So let's make that differentiation. All right? He, I don't think, and correct me if I was wrong, he didn't say you can't sing a song without talking about Jesus, but he said there are other ways you can also communicate. The name Jesus is everywhere. Unbelievers or people that don't know Jesus use the word Jesus. But if you're going to write and sing, then be more creative. And that's what this forum is about. The second thing you're talking about, um, comedy, is how much he talked about a comedian who does his comedy to a point where people give their lives to Christ at the end of it. And he was also specific that if we're going to do comedy, it is, we cannot, there is no distinct thing that says, because you put the name of Jesus in there, it will sell. You're, you're limiting yourself to a small group of people. And that's just a fact. And he's saying, if you want to grow beyond the small group of people, because the Christians will listen to the non-Christian things and would, would build a market of the non-Christian things. But then the people that are non-Christians, the Christians are not doing enough for them to also so expand what you have so if you're a gospel singer it all depends on the market you're trying to get to and i think from everything that he said so far think beyond your market and that's the that's the bottom line so you shut off at comedy in that particular church because you felt it was not a defined now there is a there's a gospel concert and that's the one thing we, we've come to this point where we put ourselves in boxes and i think he alluded to that you put yourself in a box if we're doing a worship concert it is a worship concert and everything has we've put this name tags and sometimes we don't allow ourselves to grow and he said one last thing and i'll, and I'll stop with this and he said uh, pastor Wale said when he was drawing as a kid and could memorize things by tintin he was told to, you know, focus on something else, and he let that go. But yet, several years down the line, he still ends up being a graphic designer. He could have been a lot more. If we don't leave these boxes where the same boxes were created, I mean, who created praise and worship before the word? People did. But if you grew up with that, you would always think that's how church is. But we're getting to a point where actually... What if the word starts before praise and worship? Or we just turn it around? Or what we need is just to move things around. If you keep yourself within these boundaries, you will never grow. And I'll leave with this, with something that you have said, and I'll just hand this over to you. The world is such a huge place. I was taking, and I'll leave this story. I was taking someone, one of the ladies who died of breast cancer, I was taking her to one of her, appointments i was in my car but while i was in my car taking her there i had my laptop on me the same laptop no sorry my ipad that was here i was helping a church do a 21 days non-stop streaming non-stop and they contracted me to do this project because they couldn't get the media team to come to church every day so they had the church was where in one of the halls was where everyone that was leading this prayer, every one hour, no, every three hours, someone comes to lead for an hour, and then we'll play worship songs in between. And then, so every three hours, there was a facilitator. Every three hours, for 21 days, nonstop. I have never done it before. But I had the expertise. I knew the technology that would make it work. We used vMix. So a church would come, and there was just a microphone cam that would stream to my studio at home. Look at how church, church, was streamed to my studio at home where the vMix was. And I had all the playlists of all the music. So I was switching live. But guess what? When I was taking this girl, I had my iPad and we got caught in traffic. And the next facilitator was coming on. I packed the car, opened my iPad, tapped into my studio via technology called the person, spoke to the facilitator because I have to talk to them five minutes before they go live to say, okay, you're going to go live. And I switched my vMix, which was in my studio, using my iPad over 4G network on the side of the road, did live. You're at home. You didn't realize that was just switched. I was not on my desk. 
technology is expanding. There is there are no longer any boundaries, and I'll stop by that. So, no. I want to add something to that thought, and this is for everybody, and this this will heal you. Um, no, no, it will. You see, first of all, the balance you are seeking is oppressive. You are oppressing us. It's not what you are doing intentionally, but you see, I said tradition is peer pressure from dead people. You see. There, there, is, you, you, there is an arrest of your own elasticity such that you are going to judge newness by the weight of the old. It should be the other way around. The, the, you should not put old into new. You see what I'm saying? And you should not put new into old. New can only go into new container. Once you bring old into any part of the imagined and the sit situating the new, you are going to create conflict and crisis, not just for yourself, but for those who consume you as well. And so I want to tell you guys this. Secular is not things that doesn't have the name of Jesus in it. Go and do your English grammar very well. When you say something is secular, it's not that the name of Jesus is not in it. Even if the name of Jesus in it, sir, it can, it can still be secular. Let me prove it to you. Secular is anything, whether it's a message, a thought, a song, a, an environment, a theology, um, an assumption, a theory, a philosophy, an ideology, whatever it is. Anything that claims to be religious but has no social significance is secular. Anything that when religious ideas have no social significance, it is secular. So let me, let me break that down. If you are in church on Sunday in the name of Jesus and you are preaching in the name of Jesus, but that conversation that is happening in the name of Jesus does not have social significance. It is secular. So people are in churches Sunday in, Sunday out in secular experiences. Because what they are talking about does not have social significance. It's not, there's no social significance to what they are talking about. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if I'm teaching you on Sunday and everything I'm saying cannot connect to what is going on in society. It's not connecting. It's not doing anything like that. There's no clear, usable, transferable value within that conversation. It is still secular. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope you really understand that. So, so secular can happen in the name of Jesus. And you are still secular all the same. But the deeper question as you ask you is, do you have a problem with going to a barbing salon to cut your hair? Do you know who is cutting your hair? Do you know who he is? His beliefs? Do you know if he is gay? Do you know if he's a ritual killer? Hmm? Do you know if he has six girlfriends in his house? He just left, he just slept with six girls before he came to cut your hair. Are you aware? Hmm? Do you know? Does it bother you that you don't know? good. The hotel you sleep in, do you know who owns the hotel? Do you know who slept on that bed yesterday? <laughs> eh? Does it bother you? It should bother you. It has to bother you. If you want to think linear, like we think linear, about where the name of Jesus is, what is Christian, what is not Christian, you should first of all say, this cloth you are wearing, who sold it? Where is the material from? Is it a Christian garment? Your lecturer in school, my lecturer, my economics, mathematics lecturer was a Muslim. I understood. Now, the one that was teaching me econometrics, a Christian, I understood the Muslim teacher. E economics, mathematics was my best subject. The one I was failing past, past semester is that econometrics. 
So your lecturer in school, does it bother you whether he's Christian or he's Muslim? Do you even have a choice to reject him? <laughs> or you're about to fail? Or you're about to be rusticated? These things are bigger than religion. Do you understand? These things are bigger than that. So the idea is, you, you sh whether the name of Jesus is in it or not, the question is, I am a Christian. I want to teach you how to think. And I tell you, when you wake up in the morning, take a bottle of water, first of all. Does that help you? Will that help you? It will. Your medical doctor in the general hospital, when you go and see him, he's a Muslim. He also wants you to help you to think. And he says to you, like, guy, when you wake up in the morning, drink water. Is my own more powerful than his own? No. It's the same. Do you understand? So if you think like that, right, you understand that two things are in the Bible. The things that belong to Caesar and the things that belong to God. God made Caesar. I don't have a problem with Caesar. I, I'm not contesting with Caesar. I made him. Give to him what belongs to him. It is what belongs to me I want. I don't want anything that belongs to Caesar because this Caesar is my creation. The problem with most people is we don't know the things on the list of what belongs to Caesar. We don't know the things on the list of what belongs to God. So we give to Caesar what belongs to God and we give to God what belongs to Caesar. Is what I'm saying. So we need intelligence to really understand what bothers God and what doesn't. You see what I'm saying? So that you can't worry for God. You just have to take your place in that reality and function within it. So don't be bothered about where, uh, what has the name of Jesus, what doesn't have the name of Jesus. Does he edify? Does he lift up? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because as a Christian, you are going to play a million roles in life. You don't understand, you don't understand what I'm saying? So don't seek that balance you are seeking. Don't seek it. Now, if you want to write a song that has the name of Jesus in it, you are free to do that. The guy who took the name of Jesus, there are things I do today that if I put the name of Jesus in it, I'm going to get stuck. It doesn't reduce my power. Paul understood that. He said, to those without law, I became as without law, though not without the law of Christ. Because the law can give you a container that will not give people any reason to check your content. At times, you have to masquerade your container so that you can gain access for them to see your content. And that's deeper. You see what I'm saying? So wear these different scenarios and know when to appear to the wise, you become wise. To those who are foolish at times, you become foolish. To those who are without law, you come as without law. Do not without the law of Christ. To those who are with law, you give them the law. You have become all things to all men as your chance to save them and to save some. You see what I'm saying? That's the way it works. All right, we have one last question. Good uh, afternoon. My name is Omolola Babalola. My, um, I want to ask the second speaker. Um, my friend was watching online, so he said I should ask this question. He said, um, if you're in the industry and you have the skills, how do you get the business? How do you approach people or companies? Okay. I think, I think that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, Some people don't, in our industry, it's hard to do things for free because of sometimes even how to get the things. But if you can start doing free stuff, you'll be surprised how much you, you get your foot in. Getting your foot into the door is sometimes very, very difficult because there is competition. There would always be competition. So he or she can always start with the free stuff. I learned through apprenticeships. Funny you mentioned something. I learned through apprenticeships. So if, for example, let's use Lighthouse, for example, you have a content, maybe they're doing a few things and he, he can produce content. Why not bring his camera when church is doing a few things, take permission from media, take his own shot, do a cut and send to Lighthouse. And it becomes something that lights out, Lighthouse puts out there. Someone is going to see it. Someone is going to see it. In our creative world, they must see your work. And honestly, a lot of free jobs, and sometimes it might be someone's wedding. Your friend is doing a wedding, all right? 
and you've been trying to, you know, shoot things. You're not the one being paid to, sh to cover that wedding, but you've practiced a few times. Take your camera, it could even be your phone, and do your own version of that recording, cut it and send it to them. You never know who is going to ask you to do the next job. And that's how I have done quite a number of things. And it is very tasking when you're doing free things, but it is one way to get in. Just make your stuff available. And what you'll realize is that it also gives you an opportunity to practice. It's that one thing, and he, uh, you know, um, he was talking about getting to that point of getting, becoming an authority. It's when you've done it over and over and over and over again. And when people see your work, they can tell. So for those of you trying to get in, whether you want to be a cameraman or whether you're producing stuff, I have a friend who writes a lot of things. And I said to her, she said, oh, she's not feeling, because things are not going well in her life. She's in a very, you know, deep uh, place. She's not happy. That she feels if she writes all these um, words that who's going to believe her when they're looking at her life? And she feels, I'm like, I don't even know what's happening in your life. I said, but when God starts to pour you that inspiration, you're denying other people the gift that he's put in you. Just because you think the vessel yourself, you're not, not in a good place. You're already feeling that inspiration to write what you want to write. Write it. Put it down because one day, one day, it will become relevant. So if you're trying to go into things, do it. Just do it. You're trying to get into a business you're, or you're good at what you're, you're good at. And this thing happens to me. I, I have a friend who's like, with well, the kind of things you do, David, you should not even be on this level. You should be there. I never knew that I would ever get a chance to stay in front of Disney. Never thought so. But when the opportunity came for Disney, I did not even know what, I wasn't sure. I just said, okay, they gave me five minutes, five minutes to do a presentation before Disney. Where do I even start from? So I made sure that, look, let me just do 90 seconds. Meanwhile, someone else stood, recorded himself. I thought this guy would just trash it. I showed my works. He talked about his. I showed my works in 90 seconds. And that lady said to me, the first thing she said, I said, don't you ever make the mistake that other person made by talking and recording themselves. Just said, you went straight. In 90 seconds, David, you caught my attention. In 90 seconds. In our, wor in our, in our world as creatives, people have to see your work. They have to see it. Spend time to package what you're doing. And I'll repeat what I said just before I sit down. Let other people see your work before you send it out there. Let people criticize. If you think you have a message, take it to, your, take it to a boy, a small boy. Hmm? Show them what you've done. and say, Ask them what they feel about it. Because you have to communicate. If you have not communicated, it's not going to go anywhere. I've done work for people. They send me things to criticize. And I am very tough when it comes to criticizing because I guess I learned from Pastor Shala. I am, no, there are just some things. Even when you take photographs, I am just very, very critical. And for those of you that know that I sing, I get friends that send me stuff that they've recorded. I am usually just very blunt. Like, bros, No. And the one that gets me the most is when Christians, and, and I'm referring to the Christians here, who tell me that, that God gave them that song. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, the fact that God has given you a melody does not mean you shouldn't go to a songwriter to, 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 find you, to make sure that the message is delivered. Because you might as well be speaking in tongues and nobody knows exactly what you just said. So I once had an album released, and I, I, I had nine songs. It took me about, what, probably three years to put that album together. I sent it to a lot of friends around the world, 
to just listen and criticize. And, and my mission was arrange your songs for me in the order of the one you liked the most. The one I liked the least was the one everyone preferred, and it became the single of that album, and it became the most popular song. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank everyone so much for sitting through um, this lessons, life lessons today. So who has learned a thing or two? Okay, I can see some people are even waving. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be back here tomorrow, okay? But I need us to agree on one thing, okay? Let's come in tomorrow by 10. We kick off, we walk within the time, and, you know, be impacted. Do we agree? 10 o'clock on the dot. We're starting, all right? Okay, so thank you so much for coming, and we have come to the end of today's summit, first day of the summit. Thank you very much. Okay, please, we're, ha we're going to be taking pictures. All participants, all participants, we're going to be taking pictures.